In the Economics and Politics of Race, Dr. Thomas Sowell says that Chinese, Jews, and Japanese are overachievers, and blacks, Puerto Ricans, and Mexicans are underachievers. And it's all due to culture. and politics of race. Dr. Sowell, you have written what I consider to be one of the most exhaustive statements I have ever seen on an awfully complex subject. I'm really not sure that I understand it th that thoroughly, so let me begin by trying to get some, some general understanding. Are you saying that a, in a culturally pluralistic society such as America, are you saying that the variable in success or lack of success is the culture of the particular group? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I'm saying it not only for the United States, but in terms of the studies of various other countries around the world, the same thing seems to be true. You not only find uh, the same group having the same characteristics in country after the country. That is, the Germans produced uh, the first pianos in Australia. They created the piano industry in the United States. They built the first pianos in England. They built the first pianos in Russia. Uh, you look at the Chinese, what they major in in Malaysia in college is what they major in in the United States in college. Namely science and technology. Science and technology, heavily. Uh, and this follows the group around the world. So the notion that the group is a creature of society, that society has shaped the, the group, uh, just will not stand up to the facts. If you say that culture is the variable in success, mm -hmm. which means conversely, culture is the variable in failure, and you cite uh, the phenomenal achievement of West Indians, mm -hmm. which is the largest black immigrant group in the United States, yes. Uh, their phenomenal success in the United States, I think they earn about, 50, second generation earns about 15% more than, average than, than, than the average American. Than yes. the average American. But they don't do well in their own native countries, and they don't do well in England. Now, if, if culture is the variable, why is that a fact? I guess you'd have a selective migration uh, uh, coming into this. That's also true of other groups, by the way. The Chinese are prosperous everywhere in the world except China. Uh, the Indians are prosperous throughout Africa, but they are in terrible shape in India. They are prosperous in Malaysia, they are prosperous in the other parts of the world, Burma at one time. Uh, there are many groups which, when, when freed from the constraints of their particular society, uh, burst forth with all the other abilities that they have. In their own homes, uh, they're, 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 they're throttled by various other factors. Now you also delineate the uh, migration of the African from Africa mm. uh, through the Caribbean, if that took place, and then into the United States. And you distinguish, you document the difference in the form of slavery that took place in the West Indies and the form of slavery that took place in the United States, and you relate that to the performance of, of the two respective groups. Yes. Uh, in the light of what, you, what you've said, though, and in the light of the recent studies of uh, England, you can't push that too far because, in fact, uh, in the West Indies, the Chinese are disproportionately the entrepreneurs. But of the West Indians who come to the United States, you have a very heavy selection factor going on. You have that with most immigrant groups, by the way. What do you mean selection factor? That is, the average person of the average country doesn't get up and leave and go to some other country. It's the person who is unusual, if not in ability, at least in attitudes and other kinds of things like that. That's also common around the world. Uh, when um, people go into, uh, let's think of uh, the Japanese who come to the United States, the Chinese who come to the United States, they do better than the Chinese who were born in the United States. Uh, whites who come to the United States do better than whites who were born in the United States. Isn't that true of all immigrants as, as, as compared to native-born Americans? Yes, and, and compared to people of the same ethnic background. So that's true in uh, Canada and in Britain. Uh, white immigrants to Canada do better than white Canadians. White immigrants to Britain do better than white Britons. So you have a very heavy selection factor going on. Okay, now after we've all settled here for a, a generation or two, mm -hmm. and we are all what we call America, which is a culturally pluralistic society, different cultures living side by side, we then have kind of shaken all that immigrant edge well, off, haven't not, we? Not really, not really, um, because uh, second and third generation, well, second generation West Indians, as you point out, keep on going up the ladder. Uh, these things last varying amounts of time. Sometimes they last for centuries. You have groups, for example, like the Germans who settled in Russia. They settled there for a hundred years. They left Russia the same people they were when they came there. They, many of them still didn't speak Russian. They continued the German that they'd already had. The habits were completely German. And they came to the United States, they were completely German. And they settled out in the uh, far west, Nebraska, uh, the Dakotas, and so on, and have a pattern of life that came straight out of Germany as if they had never been in Russia. Well, what is it in American life today? You cite six groups in two categories. Mm -hmm. you, you cite uh, uh, Jews, uh, 
Chinese and Japanese as overachieving groups. You cite blacks, Puerto Ricans, and Mexicans as underachieving groups. Mm -hmm. Now, what are you describing there? What, what, what have you identified there as, as a variable? Oh, in, income, well, the achievement is measured in terms of income and occupation. That is economic achievement. Obviously, there are other kinds of things that make, make up life. But, um, and I wouldn't want to stigmatize groups as permanently underachievers. If you look at generation by generation, you find incredible changes. Uh, the black, black population especially, the uh, change in occupations of blacks between the 1920s and the 1950s is just phenomenal. So that what we're w watching are people who, for cultural reasons and historical reasons, begin behind a certain level uh, and have not closed the gap. It's like a relay race. You don't say that the runner is a, is a bad runner because he hasn't closed the gap when he started 50 yards behind. If he's 40 yards behind now, we don't call him a failure. We say he's made up 10 yards. Well, I'm sure you do know the conventional wisdom in America is that every immigrant group to this country, with the exception of blacks, has closed the gap. That's not really true. It depends upon what time frame you're talking about and how you define the groups. Uh, the Chinese who've come here from Hong Kong and other parts of China um, since the Second World War uh, are in dire poverty in many parts of Chinatowns of, the, of New York, of San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, in many cases far worse off than uh, the average black. So that, that, that isn't true that every group has done this. Uh, blacks started much, much further behind. I don't think people realize how much further behind blacks started and how much progress has been made. Uh, there's a distinguished economic historian, uh, Robert Higgs, who has said that uh, for blacks to go from being completely illiterate uh, in the middle of the 19th century to being one half literate and by 1900 is just an amazing achievement in the history of the world, that you very seldom find that kind of uh, change that quickly. So it depends on what, what you're holding as your standard. The standard is that blacks haven't caught up with whites. With, with whites, whites haven't stood still. <laughs> <laughs> you point out that over 50% of the PhDs awarded to blacks is in education. And you don't seem to think much of a PhD in education. It's not a question of what I think. It's a question of what the marketplace thinks. And there's not much money in that. So if you're going to compare blacks and whites who have PhDs, you have to realize you're talking about apples and oranges. If you're going to compare uh, uh, you know, blacks and uh, Asians with PhDs, you are really talking about apples and oranges, since the Asian PhDs will be disproportionately in math, science, technology, and fields like that. So that, uh, I think that's a rational choice to some extent. Insofar as people have not had the same educational background, they must do what they can do, not what they would like to do. What's encouraging to me is that second generation blacks in college, that is blacks whose parents went to college before them, are majoring in mathematical and other such areas to almost exactly the same extent as the general society. So again, as you break these numbers down, there is a sign of progress, but there's very little sign of any kind of miracle taking place. What do you mean miracle? That is, there are people who will talk in terms of what the proportion of blacks are who earn so much or are represented in various occupations. Uh, you're not going to be an engineer unless you've got an engineering degree. Uh, and if blacks' degrees are in education, then we don't expect to find blacks represented in engineering in proportion to blacks in the society. So that's an example in which our cultural choice determines our income. Our income is, is partly due to the income gap between blacks and whites. Is that part of it? Yes, yes. But that's true not only with blacks and whites, it's true right across the board. Uh, the difference between Asians and, Hispa and Hispanics, for example, at the, at the Ph.D. level and earlier, uh, is uh, slightly greater than that between blacks and uh, Asians, or certainly greater than that between blacks and whites. So the black-white difference that we're always com comparing is not at all unique. The, the, the income difference between Japanese Americans and Puerto Ricans is higher than that between blacks and whites. And yet if you explain the black-white difference in terms of the unique history of blacks, you are left out on the limb wondering well, then why then do the Japanese exceed the Puerto Ricans by so much when their history is absolutely different from either of those two groups. Now you point out that the third world is larger than the first world, the western world, and the second world, the communist bloc combined. Yes. But you, you don't feel that there's much cohesion there or much probability of it working as a unit. No, no. One of the reasons that they're poor is because of the lack of cohesion. That if you spend your time fighting each other instead of uh, working things out, uh, you, you can't expect to do as well as people who uh, work things out. Now, unfortunately, in the West, many of the working things out has meant that the strong have conquered the weak. What about the role of politics in, in the economic future of blacks in this country? Again, I would draw upon the uh, experience of other countries and other, other uh, groups. I can't think of a single group anywhere in the world that has risen from poverty to affluence through politics. There are any number of groups that have risen from poverty to affluence through almost every other conceivable means. 
When I look at the groups that have had spectacular rises, like the Jews or the Chinese, they are almost invariably groups that stayed away from politics. And they usually stayed away until after they became affluent. Some of them, them could then afford to go into politics. But that was not the mechanism by which they got where they are. What was the mechanism? Uh, basically work, skills, saving. Now, you're saying then that the, that the train of the black community in terms of voter registration and political power, uh, political empowerment, is on the wrong track. I think that if what you expect out of that is economic advancement for the mass of black people. Now, if all that you're looking for is some advancement on the part of the, of the leaders, or if what you're looking for uh, is something like what happened in the Civil Rights Revolution, where you needed to get the Southern Jim Crow system broken, that was an enormous achievement through politics, as I point out in the book. Uh, so it's not that politics can't do anything. It's a question that politics, like everything else, has some things it can do and some things it can't do. And from what I've seen of groups around the world economically, one of the things it seems not to be able to do is raise groups from poverty to affluence. Well, who, who controls the society? Those that are in, in the political control or those in economic control? Those with economic skills tend to advance, whether they have any political power or not. And those without those skills tend not to advance, even when they have great political power. Well, what about dominating a society? Do you dominate a society through pol politics, or do you dominate it through economics? Depends on how you define it. But in Malaysia, for example, the Malays have overwhelming political domination of their society, and they use it ruthlessly against the Chinese minority. The Chinese still make double the income of the Malays, on the average. You make a statement in your book, Dr. Sol, and I would like to quote, discrimination has been pervasive, but not pervasively effective. Yes. What does that mean? It means that people have discriminated against other people wherever they've had the power to do it, almost everywhere in the world and almost every period of history. Some groups are kept back by this and some groups, it seems to make no difference whatever. Insofar, for example, as you have entrepreneurial skills, the fact that people didn't hire Jews in the 19th century didn't stop Jews from hiring each other and setting up and dominating industries such as the garment industry or the uh, beginning of the great Hollywood movie studios and other areas of the economy. Uh, it is the skills that are crucial and, not the, and not, not the fact that other people are willing or unwilling to hire you. Even groups that, that have a great animosity towards other groups will nevertheless hire members of those groups with skills in the long run if there are enough of them to make it worth their while. What's the lesson in that statement for black Americans? Skills are what matters. Uh, if other people will not uh, acknowledge your skills in the short run, then those same skills are useful in the black community with other blacks. Uh, it's what has made other groups advance from poverty to affluence. I know of nothing else that's really done it.